Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Listen, uh, I want to welcome everyone uh, to uh, another opportunity for growth and development. Um, we're actually launching again afresh this year, a uh, time of study and impartation, uh, development and growth. Um, I'm, we left off last year talking about the emotionally healthy leader, and we want to actually pick up there. Uh, but tonight what I want to do is uh, I want to do an overview. I don't want to do a review just to, to hit some key points uh, that brought us to a place to where we left off last year. Rather than just jumping into it, I want to refresh your minds. I want to get you in, in gear and moving again uh, as we become better leaders, as we become emotionally healthy uh, in this season. And so we're going we're gonna to just kind of be talking about it. It's an incredible, incredible study. And uh, I don't know about anybody else, but it has, it has done so many things for me in opening up my understanding um, to, to myself, who I am, uh, some things in me. Uh, no matter who you are, I believe that this particular uh, study, this particular writing uh, will be helpful and beneficial to you. And so what we're going to do is we're going to do uh, a little overview. We're going to kind of talk about things that I believe were pertin pertinent and important that, led, that will lead us up to where we left off. And next week, we'll jump right in where we left off. <coughs> I want to encourage you that if you have any questions, comments, or thoughts, please uh, uh, raise your hand, or if you're out there, send them in to us so we can actually address that. Um, the whole of this study is about transformation. It's about transforming the inner life uh, and how that will, that will deepen our ability to be life transformers, to transform our churches, to transform the teams that we work on, and also to be world transformers. How many of you know that ultimately that's what God called us to be, world transformers? Um, you might not be at, the, at that pinnacle transforming a whole world, uh, but you are part of world transformation in that you have a territory. You have a place that God has called you to. Now, as we talk about the emotionally healthy leader, it is it's imperative that we understand um, or talk about what it looks like. What is an emotionally unhealthy leader? Sometimes we don't know we're unhealthy until we understand or until we see something that, that brings into focus um, uh, where we are and who we are. So what is an emotionally unhealthy leader? An emotionally unhealthy leader is someone who operates in a continuous state of emotional and spiritual deficit. A continuous state of emotional and spiritual deficit. Um, I've, it's been my experience in, in, in churchdom uh, that all these years uh, from childhood to now uh, I've been uh, exposed to, you know, men and women who were uh, spiritual giants, but emotional babies. And their emotional deficiencies affected their spiritual leadership, their spiritual movements, uh, because at some point there was not an understanding that the two go together. Um, and I cannot be spiritually mature and be emotionally immature and be effective. Um, so an emotionally unhealthy leader uh, is a leader, is someone who operates in a continuous state of emotional and spiritual deficit, lacking emotional maturity and a being with God that's sufficient to sustain their doing with God. That's going to be something central that you'll hear throughout this teaching, the importance of being with God uh, and how essential that is to doing for God. And in most cases, what you'll find out as we talk through this study is that in most cases, we, have, we spend more time doing for God than we do being with God. Uh, and so we don't have the fortitude, we don't have the strength or the foundation to be able to balance our actions and our movements. I don't know about anybody else, but, you know, as I've been going through this, it brought me to that point to where I realized that I got to find a balance, uh, a balance between doing 
uh, for the Lord and being with God, doing for the Lord is, is one of the most important things in the world to me. I just didn't realize how much, how important being with God um, was to doing for God. Um, I didn't realize that the more you do for God requires you to spend more time with God in order to have balance. Um, it is our time with God. It is that time spent um, um, in, in intimacy with God that we're not only built up and strengthened, but we are made aware uh, of ourselves. We're made aware of our inner, our inner being. Uh, I said that it's an emotional deficit. Emotional deficits are manifested primarily by a pervasive lack of awareness. In other words, uh, I am a way that I'm not aware that I am. And in most cases, I've been that way for so long, it's difficult for people to help me understand where I am. Uh, because we, uh, and, and let me say this, you're never the best judge of who you are. Never. Um, uh, number one, the word of God kind of helps us define something. <clears throat> and I say it like this, the more you learn who God is, the more you learn of God, the more you learn of yourself. Um, because then it is God that becomes our standard and it helps us measure who we are and where we are. So emotional deficits are manifested primarily through a pervasive lack of awareness, an unawareness of who uh, I really truly, truly am. How many of you know that you actually can convince yourself that you are whatever you really, really want to believe? Doesn't, doesn't take a whole lot. Um, unhealthy leaders lack, for example, awareness of their feelings, their weaknesses and, and limits. They're unaware many times of how their past impacts their present. Um, I was having a conversation a little while ago, and one of the things that, that I, I learned, and that's most people in most cases, don't want to deal with past. They don't want to deal with past because past for them is to bring up what I don't really want to think about or what I think or I believe is unnecessary uh, to actually even deal with. Um, I'm exposed to that a lot in counseling, especially in marital or premarital counseling. When I talk about the, the need for couples uh, to talk about past, and in most cases I hear it uh, unequivocally, why do we have to deal with the past? We're, we're about to build a future together. And it's so difficult to get them to understand that your future is going to be based on uh, uh, some things that are part of your past. And if you don't deal with those things or if those things aren't exposed, <clears throat> for instance, there is what I call the ministry of marriage. And that is where two people, I believe, when, when you cut covenant together, I believe that God releases an anointing that empowers you to be able to minister to your partner um, more so than anybody else. But in order to carry out the ministry of marriage, because even sometimes, <clears throat> you know, and I'll, I'll use my wife and I, for example, sometimes she doesn't understand what, what motivates me, what drives me, uh, what might even cause some responses. She only learned that as we talked about past, as we talked about life coming up, as we talked about experiences, as we talked about disappointments. Um, these are the kind of things that helped her understand. So sometimes when I flip the script, she just understood, okay, I know what's wrong with him, uh, rather than a thing becoming personal. Uh, you notice I'm kind of picking on me right now. <clears throat> I'll pick on her later. Because of the deficit uh, and how leaders deal with those deficits, they therefore lack the capacity or the skills to enter into uh, the feelings and perspective of, of others. They lack that ability to deal with the perspective of others. Some, some, there's a question or a comment. Um, I think you basically um, kind of went over the answer that I was, um, or the question that I was about to ask. Yes, make sure that's on. Should the green light is on down there? Okay, it was on mute. Go ahead. Okay, um, I think you basically <coughs> answered the question because I hear a lot, you know, when it comes down to um, dealing with certain issues or becoming aware of certain things, most people don't 
um, when you talk about the past, they feel like they're having to relive the past <laughs> instead of being brought to awareness of some of the things that have hindered them or caused them to be a certain way. So what would you recommend when, when those kind of things come up? Because I know sometimes we hear it, and so people thinking like, hey, I don't need to deal with my past, but your past is a part of your future too. So if you don't deal with it, it's just like in um, the other passage, it talks about shadows. Those things continue to follow you. So how do you get a person to really go back and look on some of those things, and not in a bad way, but understanding like, part of what they're saying is just bringing you to awareness of some of the issues that you may have that will hinder you from going forward in relationships. I don't, I don't know if there's specifically a set way that you do this. I think it has a lot to do sometimes with the individual themselves, the relationship that you have with them, but in a more general sense, uh, it is to teach people how, number one, how important their past is to their present and their future. They have to realize that there are things in my past that are important and prevalent to my future, to me going forward. Uh, sometimes there are things that hold us back because of our past. They have shaped and formed habits and other things in us that, ha that can only be broken when I recognize the pattern, when I recognize the structure of, of, of what drives me. I have the habit of when I talk to people and they say to me something, I always ask them, they tell me, well, this is what I like. This is what I don't like. Um, this is how I am. I always ask them why, why, why I need you to give me. And most of the time their answer is, I don't know. That's just the way I am. Well, it's never good enough. And so it then allows me to probe a little bit deeper. You need to know why. Um, oftentimes, and I think all of us have felt certain ways and not really known why I feel that way, uh, why I like this and why I don't like that. Um, and until we understand it, then I get to determine whether it's good or not. I might not like something and it might not be from a good place. It comes from a dysfunctional place. Something in my past shaped that, formed that in me. You know, something as simple as uh, I'm not crazy about people eating uh you know you're sitting at the table and somebody says that looks good can i taste it <laughs> and it's like i almost want to buy them i just buy you one <laughs> you know i buy you a whole plate or i order a whole meal for you uh to taste rather than tasting out of mine and i was that way for a long time but i didn't know where it came from <clears throat> and uh I, I hope my mom's not listening right now <laughs> but when we were little uh, we were young coming up, and she would fix our plates, and she would come by, I think because she knew it irritated me, and uh, I think in some ways she was trying to break me of that, but she would come by and take her fork, and she would dip it in something and get a piece of it, and it would irritate me so bad, and I would go, ah, oh, mama, stop. She said, well, yours is just better than mine. It's just better than mine, and, and, and she laughed about it. Well, that was harmless. It was harmless. No, it wasn't. It, it created something on the inside. And so when it came down to it, I'm a giver. I, I will share whatever I have, but that was a no-no. You, you can't do that. I'd buy you a whole steak then let you taste mine, you know. And if you don't like it, I don't even care if you don't eat it. <laughs> but I didn't want to give you a piece of mine. It's a simple thing, but it was dysfunctional. It was dysfunctional. And until I recognized it, I could not deal with it. And so uh, the key to helping people is to help them, uh, first of all, recognize um, a thing that might or might not be good. Also, I challenge them. Why? Tell me why. Why you like that? It's not good enough. I never understood why with my parents if they say, why'd you do that? And you couldn't tell them, oh, oh no, oh, no. You could then. But now I realize that there was always reasons for what we did, always reasons for what we did. Even if it was just, I just, I wanted to do it, okay? But there was always a reason. It becomes imperative that we understand that aspect of ourselves so that we can grow, so that we can develop and mature. Leaders who are not self-aware 
don't make great leaders all the time. Their leadership will always be hindered and marred because they, they are not self-aware. Uh, they're, they're sometimes obstinate and dominant. Uh, aggressive, and everything has to shape and center itself around them, their ideas and their thoughts. Also, any thoughts that you have that opposes their thoughts or that, you know, maybe broadens their, their thoughts, uh, they're unreceptive to it because they're, they're not self-aware. They're not. So they're insecure. That's another one of those traits. They're insecure and they have other things going on. And so if some of these traits fit you, it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Because you can wake up, you can deal with and understand what is this about me. They don't always work well with others. They, they don't. They have to be in control always of everything that's going on around them and everything that's happening um, um, in their environment. They got to be in control of it. And if they're not, uh, they're never going to be happy, happy with that. Um, you know, I, I, I use the term, they don't play well with others, you know, and somewhere in in the, their development they've been made to be comfortable with that this is the way i am and nobody's really challenged it i think all of us need challenges in our lives we need people who challenge us systems that challenge us to become better um the one thing i've learned about god is before he builds a thing up he tears something down um ah, don't like it <laughs> but it's necessary to become more of what God wants you to be and to become more effective. So God tears down before he, he builds up. Um, that last little piece, they, are, they lack the capacity or the skill sets to enter into deep, to the deep feelings and perspectives of others. Um, um, for lack of a better word, they, they are not sensitive to what you're, you're thinking or what your perspective is. They're not. Uh, and they don't have the ability to to be. Now, there are four characteristics, and I thought this was important too. Uh, in the weeks that we that we did the study, there uh, that we started the study prior to um, coming back, there were four characteristics of emotionally unhealthy leaders. Uh, number one, they have low self awareness, and 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 I've mentioned that they have low self awareness. Um, number two. They prioritize ministry, uh, well, they prioritize the, uh, ministry over uh, their marriage or their singleness. They prioritize it over their marriage or their singleness. I know sometimes we feel like we've been taught that ministry should be uh, priority over marriage and over singleness, uh, but that's not true. In order to have balance and to have a better perspective, there needs to be uh, a balance between um, um, marriage and and or if you're single, there needs to be a balance uh, in in an individual's perspective. Uh, you cannot you cannot have a, a dysfunctional private life and have a successful public life. It, it doesn't work. And ministry ministry, the success of ministry in anybody's life, if you're married. Your marriage is the foundation for successful ministry. If it's a wreck, that's what ministry will be eventually because your private failure will bring down your public success. If you're single, it, it's important that you embrace your singleness, that you nurture your singleness, that you do everything it takes to develop your singleness. I said this to some singles one time. You got to learn how to celebrate your singleness. They couldn't get that. Because most singles, most singles don't want to be single. <laughs> you know, it's funny. And I laugh about it all the time because every time I, I, I see it, there's certain things I watch over and over and over again. I watch The Lion King, and I'm always reminded of the little incident where um, the little, the little um, toucan was in the little, the little bone prison where Scar had him. And uh, the little meerkat was running from hyenas, and the meerkat was saying, let me in, let me in. And the toucan was saying, let me out, let me out. And sometimes married and single is like that. You know, there are married people saying, let me out, let me out. And single people saying, let me in, let me in. And that's because neither one has really s evaluated, proper, aligned, and are willing to celebrate being married, celebrate being single. Uh, and understand that God has a way, uh, a will, and a purpose 
for marriage and for single. Um, to be honest, you know, being single for a long time, uh, I realized that there were things, there are more things that God can do with a single individual than he can with, with someone that's married. Scripture even bears it out because uh, in Scripture he says uh, that, that a married person has to share their energies for God with their partner. Okay, it's a threefold accord. But a single person has the ability to do more for the Lord. But both of them have to be healthy, whether they're single or they're, or they're married. They have to be healthy in that disposition of life so that they can be, so they can be effective for the, for the Lord. Um, number three, they, don't, they do more activities for God than than their relationship with God can sustain. They do more activities for God than their relationship with God can, can really, really sustain. Got another question? Yes. Got a comment? Okay. Okay. <clears throat> mm. and, and can I be, can, can I be transparent? You know, um, I'm, I'm, I'm over that now. <laughs> <laughs> but I know what it is to be so busy for God that I did not have priorities straight in line. And so there were, there are things that went lacking uh, because I was so, so busy trying to do for God, trying to do for God, not only in relationships but even in my own personal well-being, my own personal growth and development. Uh, and so I'm telling people all the time now, you know, I tell young ministers, you know, um, don't study to, to teach or preach, study to live. Study to live. Let God develop you in your life. Your preaching, your teaching will come out of your experiential life with the Lord. Uh, um, and make sure you spend much time with, with God uh, so that, um, you're able to be that blessing to others that you want to be. Um, but it's going to come out of your uh, sustained relationship with God that will allow you to sustain all you're doing for God. Let me say this, and this is not necessarily something that I, uh, one of the things that I wrote down, but it just came up in my spirit. Some of us are activity driven. I just got to be doing something. And it kind of reminded me that when I looked at the fourth point, they lack a work Sabbath rhythm. They lack a work Sabbath rhythm, a Sabbath that helps me balance work. Uh, and when I say Sabbath, I don't mean a day off where we honeydew. I don't mean a day off where we take care of all the personal things. I'm talking about a Sabbath to where we rest uh, uh, in our bodies, a, a 24 hour period where we don't do anything uh, other than maybe spend time with the Lord, but just rest, rest, rest. And, and so we, we lack that, that work Sabbath balance. Uh, and, and, and I say this, and the reason it came up is because I'm so guilty of that. I mean, I mean, I've, I've been so guilty of that in my life, just always busy, busy, busy. And I've been trying for years and I'm, I'm setting myself free here. I've been trying for years to create a Monday Sabbath. So after laboring uh, uh, all week long and laboring uh, the weekend and Sunday pouring out, you know, Monday, <clears throat> stay in the bed, get up late, do nothing, rest, relax, don't answer the phone, don't check text, don't do email. But in this, in this information society, it's almost as if if I don't do something, something's going to go lacking, something's going to go missing. And what I found out is this. When I set and I'm consistent, people respect it. When I'm not, they don't. And so when I'm consistent, people stop calling on Monday. They stop texting on Mondays. Uh, when I'm not, they do things like text on Monday and say, I know this is your day off. You can answer tomorrow. You know, it's like, wow. Okay. You know, when I'm at, when I st 
started turning my phone off and don't turn it on until late in the evening is fine. And then even with that, I'm going to take this a little bit further. And I don't mean any offense, but then you have those people that you have a closer relationship with family who think that, you know, I can, I can interrupt that Sabbath because I'm, I'm family. But if the sa- if it's going to be a Sabbath, a, a day of rest, if it's going to be a period of rest, it has to be rest from everybody and everything. And so no one can feel like they have priority over that. Uh, if somebody's dying, uh, you know, holler at me. <laughs> but other than that, there has to be a willingness to stay to stay balanced. Um, one of the things that we talked about since we since I brought up family was uh, a geneogram, um, and and what her- hereditary um, has to do. Um, or what it can provide for us. A lot of times we don't want to talk about that either. A lot of times in counseling, when you run into issues with people, the first thing you got to help them understand, especially when you get when you get ready to pry into family dynamics, mother, father, brothers, sisters, uncles, cousins, grandparents, and great-grandparents, when you get ready to pry into that, the first thing you have to make sure they understand is we are not headhunting. We're not going after anybody. We're not trying to make anybody guilty or innocent. We simply want, I simply want you to understand what's going on. I want you to understand what drives you. I want you to understand what you're missing. You know, can I tell you that your family dynamics can affect everything, including your eating habits, what you eat and what you don't eat, what you like and what you don't like. And some of it, I know people that will say they don't like something. I said, well, you ever tried it? Mm -mm, I don't like it. I said, how you know? Well, I know what I like and what I don't like. No, you don't. You have no way of measuring like or dislike when it comes to the taste of something you've never tasted. How do you do it? Um, But dynamically, it's funny. I had a conversation and you say, well, how is all this important? It's very important because this is about self-awareness. I had a conversation with someone that I watched put sugar on their rice. And, and here it is now. Anybody who puts sugar on your rice, if, if you like it, I love it. I mean, it's cool. But I always want to know why. That's all you got to do, baby, tell me why. C- can, I tell you, can I tell you, for most people, not all, but for most people, when you were a baby to get you to eat the rice, somebody put some sugar on it. But they forgot to break you of <laughs> the sugar habit. And so now you're grown, in some cases, rusty grown. Because this person was about 58 years old and they were still putting sugar on their rice, you know. And so when we talked about it and I brought that up, they thought, well, yeah. Well, I never thought about that. I said, I, 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 see, the more we understand about our genealogy, the more we understand about our family dynamics. Uh, I had a meeting with, the, with with someone and they were telling me that when they looked up the genealogy of their family uh, and they're divorced they realize that um, divorce runs in their family they said to me something that blew me away you know they went back a couple of generations and they had no sustained marriages in their family line and they are dealing with um, wounds and bruises and bitterness and anger and da, da 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 And what they're realizing is, is that this is not all about th- my marriage that failed. It's about the generational curse of marriages in my, in my family. Once you understand that, you understand how to war with the enemy. You understand how to deal with your own inner self. Okay. Your, your so-called likes and dislikes that are shaped and formed from your personal life experiences uh, and, and, and other things. So that kind of blew me away. Um, the geneogram is a special visualization of or a listing of family relationships. And it's not like the genealogy would that just list the individual and the relationship to the to another person. But it actually goes into details. Uh, it, it, it talks precisely about the family tree and some of the information about it. It gives clues into relationships and other things. <coughs> uh, it, it helps uh, people to understand that um, one of the reasons that that there are sibling rivalries is because there have always been sibling rivalries in their generations. 
and uh, understanding how to break those 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 things. I believe this, and this is not in my notes either. I believe that we are the generation of curse breakers. I believe that we're the generation that God wants to use to break the curse of our generations, those things that have plagued us. Um, we're, we're doing now on Sundays, uh, shameless plug, come to church. The, we're doing something on Sundays now, and we're talking about, or tune in to, tune in to us. We're talking about that whole uh, thing of, of anointing and double portion. And one of the things that the anointing or that, that influence or that increase of grace does is it positions you or empowers you to break curse, to break curse with Elisha, with after receiving the, that double portion of anointing, the first thing he did after he parted the Jordan was he went to a land that was cursed and that was, that was barren and he broke the curse so the land now could flourish. I believe that God has called us to break some of the curses so that the land can flourish. And remember this, you're not just breaking the curse for you, but it has to start with you. You're not just breaking it for you, but you're breaking it for uh, your generations. You're breaking it for, family, for the family dynamics, the structure that's around you, and uh, for your uh, posterity going forward, those that will come after you. You're creating now a path for them to have success like you never had, for them to have freedom like you never had, for them to have the success of relationships that you might not have ever had before now. Uh, they can determine things like diseases. Your geneogram can help you understand family dynamics in the area of, of, of uh, uh, illnesses and other things like that. You know, I had a friend of mine who, whom their mother passed uh, when, when she was about 40 and uh, the, where the grandmother passed when she was about 40. Uh, I think there was some about the grand, great grandmother too. And then the mother passed when she was about 45 and she's, she was then around 44 years old, but she always talked about it, always talked about it. And what happens is she never talked about, we never talked about it as a generational issue that needed to be broken. She just talked about how this happened. And it, and it was only after being diagnosed that she was able to admit that the first thing she said is, I've been expecting this. I've been expecting this because she didn't expect to live much longer than they did because that was in the, in the generations. I think once s diseases and other things that are hereditary have been exposed, we weaken the hand of the enemy to operate against us. And we know what to take authority over. Uh, some things we are more susceptible to when they are in our physical and uh, our, our, our relational genealogy. Um, we, have to, we have to deal with those, those things. Um, there are some unhealthy commandments. I thought that was important too. Um, and, I, and they're unhealthy. It's not success unless it's bigger and better. It's not success unless it's bigger or better. Big don't make, doesn't mean successful. It doesn't. Um, um, you know, you can be successful at what God has called you to do or at what you're doing and not have hundreds of, 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 of people connected. You can have a successful business and not employ 50, 100, 200 people. Success has nothing to do with size. It's about effect and impact. Okay, another unhealthy commandment. What you do is more important than who you are. That is so detrimental for any leader to think that what you do is more important than who you are. Who you are is everything, and what you do flows out of who you are. If you don't understand who you are, and if you don't have a healthy self, then it's going to make uh, what you do uh, unimportant. It really is, and ineffective. Number three, superficial spirituality is okay. That's where I look, I look spiritual, I act spiritual. But what I act, what I do, how I look, is not a real reflection, a true reflection of who I am, okay? 
you know, and we see it all the time. You know, I heard someone when I was growing up, I heard someone tell somebody else, if I wasn't in church, I, mm. <laughs> and I was thinking even as a child, what church got to do with it? You know, cause I was thinking you shouldn't, you shouldn't say that no matter what. But, but they said, the only reason I don't say this to you, uh, and I can go on. They said, I don't really don't cuss you out because I'm in church. So that means if you had not been in church, you would have. So that means, to be honest, your, your, your piety, your holiness uh, was superficial. It was only because of where you were and what it represented, not what your relationship is with God, where you are with it and what that represents. Because what we fail to realize is that everywhere we go, God is. You know, it's funny. When I was a little kid, I thought God lived at the church. I thought he lived at the church. And so there were certain things that I would never do and ever say. And if I thought it, it would make me, it would make me nervous. You know, uh, we were downstairs at the church I grew up in one time. And one of the kids did something that was like terrible. And um, I ran upstairs because I, I mean, I thought, you know, God is about to deal with this place. And so I was sitting upstairs in the seats and tears were running down my eyes. And the, the usher came over and was fanning me because he thought I was caught up. I wasn't caught up. I thought God was going to kill us because I thought he, God lived at the church and what was done was so horrible. And that was because, number one, I didn't understand who God was. I didn't understand the love of God. I didn't understand the benevolence of God. And I also didn't understand that God lives in us. And everywhere we go, he is, not just in the building. Uh, I think the building is the last place that God wants to occupy as a home. Uh, the, the building he wants to occupy is in us. Amen. What we got there? We got a question. What do you say to the leader who says, God knows my heart. I say, excuse, <laughs> excuse. Let's call it what it is. How many of you know that it's time for us really to help one another? And that's where we are honest. I'm not talking about brutal honesty, but I'm talking about honesty that, that stems out of love. I love you enough to tell you the truth. That leader that says, God knows my heart, usually it is, it is said as an excuse to be and or do or not do what they, what they should have done or, or to do something that they shouldn't do. And so it's an excuse because I'm human. We, you, they, I've heard it used all the time. You know, God knows my heart. God knows my heart. He knows my heart. Yeah, he knows your heart and he's always after it. He's always after it. God wants your heart more than anything, because if he has your heart, he has what? He has you. He has everything that's about you if he has your heart, okay? Everything I do is because I love God, because I love God. And anytime we do anything that, that we believe saddens God, then it, 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 breaks, it, it breaks our heart because we love God. And so that leader, usually it's an excuse. And they, they need, we need people in our lives that can say to us, that's an excuse. And it doesn't flow. Okay. I, I hope that that helped them. Um, number four in the unhealthy commandments is don't rock the boat as long as the work gets done. You know, when I read that right there, I wanted to just scratch it out of the out of that book. I wanted to get rid of it because it, it's like somebody reached up and slapped me. And it's like, <laughs> don't rock the boat as long as the work. And, and, and it's not as much rock the boat in the sense of I was overly concerned about um, um, how, what people would think. That's not it. For me, it was a little bit different. For me, uh, I, just, I just felt like things will work themselves out. So there are things I never dealt with. Didn't want to deal with them because it's like everybody's, Christ, you know, you're all believers, da, 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 so it'll just work itself out. Well, what I found out is it won't just work itself out. Confrontation is a necessary part of life, of Christianity, of relationships, of marriage. It's, it's just, it's necessary, and we have to be able to do, to confront and to deal with things in a very healthy, healthy way. And so that was one of those areas in which as a leader, uh, I fell horribly in, in that I felt like things would work themselves out. Um, and some things won't just work out. They have to be, they have to be dealt with. So <clears throat> I wanted to take that out of there. And uh, good thing I didn't, I don't have a choice over it because I still take it out. 
<laughs> but I have learned better. Learning to be an emotionally healthy leader takes time. It's a process that we go through. And I know we want to be at the mountaintop. But how about we just let God take us from ledge to ledge to ledge, from, from one plateau to the next uh, as he takes us up the mountain. Because I mean, you know, there's nothing that stops us from our movement of progression uh, with God except for us. If we stay submitted, stay surrendered, and let God deal with us. And I want to say this because I want you to catch this. Every time God's get, God gets ready to take you to another place, he begins to mess with the place where you are. Every time he gets ready to elevate, every time he gets ready to promote, that's why I tell people all the time, oh, you have God's releasing a greater anointing on your life. You don't, you don't need to be hallelujah. You need to be on your knees praying because that means get ready because there's some things that are about to break loose. You know, I, I'm reminded of, of, of when the Lord gets ready to move the prophet from the brook cherub to the widow woman's house. The first thing he does is he dries up the brook. In other words, the place that was sustaining him no longer can sustain him. That helped him move where he wouldn't have, because we get comfortable. We get comfortable. And I mean, how many of you got into a place where, you know, it's a good place. It's a good place of worship. It's a good place of prayer. I, the time with God is so great. I feel so incredible about it. And then all of a sudden it stops being sufficient. You know, it's like empty. You're trying to figure out what just happened. I'm, I'm praying the same amount of time. I'm spending the same amount of time studying. You know, um, my giving is the same. And all of a sudden, it feels like all hell is breaking loose. It's because the brook is dried up and God's getting ready to take you to the next place in your development. Because uh, he knows, he loves us so much that sometimes he's got to chase us out of that place. Because other than that, like Peter, we want to build a tabernacle there and stay there. It's, this is good. So I just want to stay right here. Um, so... Learning to be an emotionally healthy leader takes, takes time, uh, and it takes a willingness to trust God with you, to trust God with you and let him reveal. Um, I say this, this is definitely not in my notes. Sometimes God will send people in your life that challenge you, and you want to get rid of them. <laughs> you don't want to deal with them because they're there to challenge you. Whether they challenge you, in, in the way that they get on your nerves or whether they challenge you in the sense that they hold you accountable, okay? When they hold you accountable like that, that's when, that's when you start calling, oh, they just holier than thou. They holier than thou. It's like, you know, everything ain't spiritual. I ain't want to hear that. Uh, and they just get on your nerves. So you just want to get rid of them. I want to get rid of them because I don't, I don't want that. You go to talk to them about something, they start talking to you about you. And you know, that is so God. That is so like God. Because the first time, and I tell people all the time, if you come up to me and tell me that you, you went to God and prayed about somebody else, and I ask you, what did he say? And you start telling me what he said about them, I'm going to tell you, you weren't talking to the Lord. You need to be careful. Because anytime time you start talking to God about somebody else, he starts talking to you about you. Okay, so it's like I don't even pray about other people anymore. I don't pray about other people. I pray about me and my response to other people, and I let God deal with that. Because sometimes to get other people free, all we need to do is get free ourselves. Okay, plain and simple. Any, any, any questions, any comments, any thoughts? I'm, I'm gonna, I think that, that, that kind of nutshells because it brings us up to the point to where we'll talk, we'll kind of launch next week talking about the shadow. I think it's important that we understand what the shadow, what our shadow is, what it looks like, and how it affects us, and how God wants to uh, use our understanding of our shadow to take us to new heights and new places. So any, any questions, any comments, any thoughts? I think an important part uh, from my own journey was when you and I talked about it about two years ago, it was called, I was calling it spiritual mapping, but it really was a genogram. And when you were talking about the woman who had so many instances of death in her family, mm -hmm. I was really that woman. I never expected to live to be an adult. Wow. I never expected to live to be an adult. And my sister died early on. My grandmother died early on. My mom died early on. No one lived to be 60. I'll be 60 in a few months. 
<laughs> and so that was something that I always wondered about. All the illnesses that were in our family, I've had three terminal illnesses, but God, mm. they've all died wow. from something that was terminal. Mm. And so getting to a place to understand how it was affecting me and where I was going was key to be free. Wow. Otherwise, it would define how, how I moved, the illness I would carry in my life, or not even outlive. But that was a key piece for me in understanding that God called me to be free. He called me to be healed. Wow. Otherwise, I still have been bound by many of those diseases that I carried. Amen. Amen. That is so powerful. Think about this. God did not keep her from the very things that took others in her generation out. He allowed her to face and overcome. He allowed her to do war with and gain victory over the things that had had victory in her family line. And that then guarantees that the strength of that thing is no longer, it no longer has authority or power over her generations going forward. And that's, that's powerful. That's one thing that God has taught me over this last month and a half. There are some things that I won't keep you from, but I'm going to bring you through them. And I'm going to be with you every step of the way as you go through them. You come out on the other side of it and it changes something. Yes, sir. Uh, one of the things that really spoke to me is, as you even taught on tonight, um, I had the vision of somebody going to the gym to become healthy. And if you go into the gym to work on one specific thing, other things starts to, to weaken. So if we are going to become healthy leaders or if I'm going to become a healthy leader, I can't just work on that one thing that people say, well, you need to do better at this. Because there are some other aspects of leadership that I have to, to strengthen as well. Yeah. So we can't just identify that one thing and say, this is, this is all I need to do, and I'm going to be perfect. Amen, amen, amen. You know, even as you were talking, I, I, I'm reminded of someone I saw in the gym, and, I mean, he was, man, he was built. He was buff from, from the waist up, <laughs> and, and his legs were about that big. And, and I thought to myself, somebody need to tell the brother, get off the bench press and get on the leg press because what he wants to do is become, and that's a good picture of most believers. We're buffed in one area and bereft. We are, in, we are inadequate. We are dysfunctional. Uh, we are anemic in other areas. And I believe God wants us, wants us to become so well-rounded that we are balanced in who we are, balanced in our strength and balanced in the impact that we make in, in, in life. Amen. Amen. Listen, I want to thank everybody that, that was, that, that was viewing on, on, uh, with us here online. I want to thank you for tuning in, taking the opportunity and the time to tune in. Those of you that have come out tonight, and I'm hoping that you will join us on next week as we venture deeper into uh, the emotionally healthy leader, help, helpfully helping to transform your inner life so that the response that you have for transformation uh, to change lives, to change the world can take place uh, in your life. And so we thank you. Um, we thank you for your giving and your support of this ministry and all that you do. And I want to encourage you to continue to pray for us. I want to encourage those of you as we fast until um, Sunday. I want to encourage you to continue on your on the path of fasting. Seek the Lord. I believe that God is ready to uh, release secrets, to reveal strategies, uh, to open our understanding in, in great and powerful ways. So we love you. We thank God for you. The blessings of the Lord over your life. Have a wonderful night. Good night.